guys and welcome back to another episode of Lost Bits right here on Tetrabit Gaming, the series where we explore the scrapped, unused, and unseen content in video games. In this video, we will be having a look at the first chapter of Toby Fox's follow-up to Undertale, Deltarune, which is apparently not a sequel or prequel to Undertale, despite it having a similar looking logo and the title Deltarune itself being an anagram of Undertale. Also, I know some of you have asked for a Lost Bits video on Undertale, so I'll be using this video to gauge interest for that one as well. So if you would like to see an Undertale Lost Bits, after finishing this video, please be sure to let me know with a like and comment down below. Also, huge shout out to all the researchers over on the cutting room floor, as well as on the Underminer subreddit for finding a bunch of this content and making this video possible. And with all of that said, go grab some extra chalk so your teacher doesn't send you to get some, which results you in being transported to another dimension. It's time to find some lost bits. Alright, so to kick things off, let's have a look at some of the noteworthy audio that goes unused. First up is the papyrus dialogue sound that is used in Undertale. Although Sans can be seen towards the end of this chapter, Papyrus doesn't make an appearance at all, at least not in this chapter, and as such this sound goes unused. Next is a song titled in the files as Thrash Rating. It is speculated that this song might have been intended for a fight with a thrash machine made by Lancer and Susie that was scrapped in favor of it just... blowing up. To support this claim, the game does have an index for an unused Doom Tank enemy, which very well could have been a scrapped version of the thrash machine. The other notable audio track is technically used, but not in normal play, so I'd still classify it as essentially unused. If you mess around with the game's save files and load into a room that you aren't supposed to, a sleeping dog known as Annoying Dog, or in this instance Dog Check, will appear with this music playing. I haven't tried it myself yet, but apparently a very similar event occurs in Undertale, but with a different song. And speaking of rooms that we aren't supposed to access, there are actually three unused rooms that can be loaded. Bad news is, all of them are just empty dark rooms, but based on their naming and sequence, we can estimate what they might have been used for. The first room is titled Tor Room, and since it is found near the other room seen in Chris's house, it is likely that it would have been Toriel's room in this house as well. The next area, Town Northwest, would likely, based off the name, be the area that is gated off in the northwest part of the town. And lastly, Town Apartments would have obviously been one of the apartments that are found locked in the town. Next up, Deltarune also has quite a few bits of unused text. Admittedly, most of the unused texts are nothing more than just placeholder and failsafe text strings along the lines of message A, placeholder message C, and line 5, so I'll skip over those and I'll just show you more of the interesting ones. So first up is a set of monologue strings for an unknown character. The unknown messages are as follows. Where? Where am I? Hello? Anyone? Is... Is anybody out there? Someone? Anyone? Can anyone hear me? It's dark. It's so dark here. Someone. Anyone. If you can hear me, say something, please. The only place that I can think of where this might have been used is when the closet door closes towards the beginning of the game. As you saw, the files are even titled unused slash unused GML 1 through 10. So it appears that this text was likely scrapped early in the game's development. If you have any other theories where this might have been intended for, let me know. Next up are some unused strings that suggest that at one point there would have been more discussion topics to try in the Clover fight. 
So normally, if you want to try and spare Clover, you have to try and strike up conversations with her with talk boys, talk trees, and talk sports. However, in the game's code is an early version of the Clover fight in which it appears that you could bring up the topics of politics, religion, and gun control. All three of these are obviously very polarizing topics in the real world as well, and I assume Toby Fox likely didn't want to stir up any controversy with these in the game, and as such decided to not include them in the final release. And while on the topic of text strings, there is actually code that checks if the name you choose for your save file matches any of the 18 special name strings. These special names are either other characters in the game, or characters from Undertale. So if your save file name does match, something different will occur in the game. For example, if you name your vessel Sans, the game will respond that that name is quite a coincidence. Even more interestingly is if you try to type in Gaster as the name, as soon as you put the letter R at the end, the game will actually close itself. Kinda creepy honestly. Moving along, the game also makes reference to an old, now unused, variation of the dummy Rousey fight. This unused fight basically has dialogue that goes unused, and it would also at one point let you win the fight by hugging Rousey enough times. Additionally, one of the unused dialogue strings in this fight reads, See you in the next hell, losers! This line seems way out of character for any of the characters in this fight, and seems more like something that Lancer or Susie would say. Either way, Toby Fox decided to leave it here for whatever reason. User Christoph Howadin was actually able to recreate most of the unused fight himself. It should be noted, however, that although the dummy here has turned into the real Ralsei, in the actual fight it would still have appeared as a dummy, but loading the dummy and Ralsei here apparently causes a lot of problems. If you want to see the scrapped fight recreated with the unused dialogue in its entirety, I will leave a link to Christoph's video in the description. Next, let's talk about Deltarune's debug mode. Although it isn't as robust as we've seen in other games like Sonic Mania, it still allows us to do some pretty cool stuff. First off, as you've probably seen by now, a red number will appear in the corner displaying the amount of frames per second the game is running at. And not only can we see the frames per second, but we can also control it. By pressing P, you can increase the frame limit to 60 frames per second, making the game much faster. And by pressing the O key, you can reduce the cap to just 3 frames per second, making the game run at a snail's pace. Next, when pressing the Z key in the overworld, a red rectangle will appear showing the actual range of the action. Pressing S allows you to save pretty much anywhere, pressing L will automatically load the last save, and pressing R will restart the game. Pressing C while reading any text will skip pretty much all of it, a great tool if you're like me and don't like reading through a whole bunch of text. But probably the most interesting thing that is possible with Deltarune's debug mode is the ability to teleport between different rooms. By holding the W key and pressing any number from 1 to 6, you will be instantly teleported to a certain room near the end of the game. Similarly, by holding D and pushing a number between 3 and 9, you will arrive at other rooms seen more so in the middle of the game. Additionally, you can also press the insert key to move to the previous room as ordered in the game's code, or you can press the delete key to move to the next room. Although this was fun to play around with and super useful in getting to certain areas quickly, it did often end up softlocking the game, if not just outright crashing it. Okay, actually I lied. The most interesting thing that you can do with the debug mode is move around where you aren't normally supposed to. What I mean by this is if you bring up the debug save menu during a scripted cutscene, you can actually regain control of your character and you can move around while the cutscene continues. Although your character may not always appear to be moving, you still are. One of the weirdest things I was able to do was just move all the way to the right during the final King boss cutscene. This effectively made the game think that I beat the King, as evident with how it has changed to look like it does after defeating him. Moving around where you aren't supposed to also often causes the dialogue text to move around and not display properly. It's not all fine and dandy however, as in some other cases like here in the flower shop, since I had skipped the cutscene and came back to the room from the top, 
The game still repeated the scripted scene and forced me out of bounds where I could no longer move, which effectively softlocked the game. It was honestly a lot of fun just testing this out in various different cutscenes. If you would like to check out the debug mode for yourself, just follow the cutting room floor link in the description for more information. Before we go over Deltarune's unused graphics, I just quickly want to mention a super cool, normally unseen easter egg. If the Deltarune executable file is opened in Notepad and the font is reduced to a very small size, several ASCII images will become visible. This includes shapes like stars, squares, and circles, as well as what looks to be an entire font set. Even more interesting is if you scroll further down in the document, upside down ASCII art of the Deltarune emblem can also be seen. Weird place to hide something like this, but very cool nonetheless. Alright, and now on to Deltarune's numerous unused graphics. There is quite a few, so buckle up. First are normally unused textures intended for Ralsei's manual, which he gives you towards the start of the chapter, here titled as Ralsei's Guide to the Dark Realm. Interestingly, this wholesome book also displays that the year it was written was in the 2020s. The guide starts off with a dedication and foreword, kind of like some school textbooks do. This guide would have obviously served to aid the player with learning how to play the game as it goes over the controls, the menu, and battle mechanics. This guide was likely scrapped earlier in the game's development as it's lacking any reference to the spare command, and instead features an unused command that would appear apparently if a dog ate your command, in which you would then not be able to do anything for the rest of your life. The guide also mentions an overworld menu talk command, as well as the ability to restore TP via save points. Both of these are not seen in the final release. Ralsei's guide concludes with a note section and then a final page with a self-portrait of Ralsei with a message that he is looking forward to meeting with his new friends. In the current release of the game, if you try to read the manual, nothing really happens as apparently it is too dense, making it a rather useless item. Now I think the original intention was much better, so it's a shame that it was changed. Next we have several editor sprites that go unseen as well. These were used to signify doors, events, and other objects when developing the game. There are also several crude placeholder graphics used to mark solid objects and enemies. Yup, that's an enemy. And while we're on the topic of crude placeholder sprites, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you all to the placeholder Chris sprite. That's right, this is what Chris looked like in earlier development stages of the game. Furthermore, there are also some unused placeholder dialogue portraits for Susie, and what looks like a white Ralsei. I thought it might have been Azriel at first, but the glasses make me think it's more likely that it's Ralsei. All I can say is I'm glad that these were updated. Next, there is an early sketch of the beach area that is located east of the town at the end of the game. When compared to what we see in the game, it appears that this sketch was followed pretty closely. And for the last of the crude sketches, there is also an unseen drawing of what looks to be some sort of lighting apparatus. The colors of the lights correspond to the colors of the flowers in the back room of the flower shop, so it is believed that this apparatus might have been planned for use there. Now onto some graphics that are at least a bit more complete. First up is an eyeless dialogue portrait of THE Sans Undertale himself. So as you may know, Sans does make an appearance at the end of the game, but this sprite is never used in any dialogue sequence. Next, we have an unused sliding pose for Chris in his real-world colors. Since there is nowhere to slide in the real-world area, it makes sense why this goes unused. Even when I managed to get real-world Chris loaded into the Dark Realm, when sliding down, the sprite colors automatically change to what they are supposed to be here, which I found pretty interesting. So I mentioned the unused dog act command earlier in the guidebook, but it looks like there was also a planned interface button for it as well. Now I'm even more curious as to what this would have been really used for. Additionally, the game also contains early versions for some of the other fight buttons. They are essentially the same, but the older ones didn't have any text appear when highlighted by the player. 
There are also some unused text interfaces that would have been used during a battle to indicate whose turn it is. Deltarune also contains early versions of the trees which are seen in Scarlet Forest. As you can see, they are not as polished as the final ones, but it's interesting to note that it looks like they were planned to appear in blue and yellow as well. I guess eventually only red was chosen to be used, and hence the name, Scarlet Forest. Similarly, an early version of the grass seen in the Field of Hopes and Dreams can also be found. Here is a comparison between the early version and the one seen in the final release. And to end things off, there are a few more early animations that are left over in the game. The first of these is an early version of Chris's attack animation. It's almost identical, except for whatever reason, in the final version, one frame of the animation was removed. Next is an early animation of Malia swinging, which is similar, but the final one was just touched up. And in a similar fashion, there is also an early animation of the bell you need to ring to make the Star Walkers lose their wings. Lastly, heading into major spoiler territory are two more unused animations. The first of these is a normally unseen animation of the secret boss Jevil, dancing but facing away from the player. At first I thought it might have been just his face covered with a shadow, but the file name is titled Joker Dance Reverse. The last unused animation here is an early version of the unsettling ending scene. They are mostly similar, but the earlier ones have less shading, less messy hair, and more digging around in the chest cavity. I guess Toby Fox wanted to reduce the gore at least a little bit. And with that concludes this Lost Bits video on the first chapter of Deltarune, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to check out some of my other Lost Bits videos by clicking on the card right here. If you're new here and would like to stay even more up to date with me and the channel, be sure to subscribe here as well as swing by my other social media things which will all be linked in the description below. But as always guys, thank you all so much for watching today and for all of your amazing support, and I will see you in a bit.